subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. Hello viewers across the globe. I welcome all of you to your favorite one uh, of integrated science on joy learning. Previously, we did some few recaps on measurements. So we were introduced to measurements of length, mass, and volume. Many a times when we go around lifting things, we notice that some of the things we carry are more heavier than the others. And today we want to investigate why some are more heavier than others. To help us do this, we shall be looking at our learning objectives for today. And by the end of this lesson, I pray that you viewers will understand and you appreciate and define density and also measure density and relative density. Density has got something to do with how heavy or how light a substance is. And to help us do this, we will have to determine the mass of a substance and compare it to a given volume. And for the sake of comparison, we will have to do it in terms of standards. So when defining density, we will have to restrict the definition to a given volume. So by definition, we say that density is the mass per unit volume of a substance, the mass per unit volume of a substance. So if you want to determine the density of a substance, it means you have to determine the mass and also determine the volume. Then you can divide the mass by that volume to give you the density. Mathematically, density is expressed as showing on a screen. Density equals mass of the substance, like I said earlier, divided by the volume of the substance. And in terms of symbols, to make the expression very simple, simple, we use letters to represent density, mass, and volume. Well, density is represented by the Greek 17th letter of the alphabet called rho. So we use rho to represent density, and we use m to represent the mass of the substance we want to determine its density. Now, we also use V to represent the volume of the material in question. So since density equals mass of a substance divided by the volume, then we can say that rho should be equal to M divided by V. I hope viewers, you are enjoying the expression because we are going to use it very soon to do simple calculations. Now, we've been able to determine what density is. And when you come out with a measurement, you also have to look at the unit. What should be the unit for that measurement? We know that the SI unit for mass in our previous lesson, we were told that mass is measured in kilograms. And kilograms is represented by kg. So if you have any mass measurement, you will have to convert it to kilograms. And you have to do that by dividing by 1,000. Now, the volume is also measured in meter cube meter cube. So we have a meter times a meter times a meter. So we can say therefore that the density, which is the same as mass over volume, will have the unit of kilogram divided by the meter cube. Divided by the meter cube. So moving on, we can say that the SI unit of density is therefore kilogram per meter cube. Kilograms per meter cube. Now, interestingly, all measurements of mass in grams must be converted to kilograms unless otherwise stated by the question or whoever is supervising your work. So if you do any measurement in mass and you want to use it for calculation, you have to convert it to kilograms and you do so by dividing by thousands. So we can say that the mass measurement in grams are converted into kilograms, and we do this by dividing the mass by a thousand, or 10 to the power three. 10 to the power three. Now, volume measurements in centimeters cube are also converted to meter cube. 
most of the equipments we have around us helps us to measure volumes, but the volumes we get are in centimeters cube. So we have to convert it to meter cube, and we do so by dividing by a million, as we were taught in the previous lesson in terms of volume conversions. So you have to divide the volume measurement by a million or by 10 to the power six, as shown on your screen. So let's take an example. We have been given a rock with a volume of 10 meter cube, and it weighs 100 grams. And we are to calculate the density of the rock. So the question reads, a piece of rock with a volume of 10 meter cube weighs 100 grams. You have to calculate the density of the rock. So just like any other mathematical expression, you will have to represent the statements with symbols or variables, as we normally call it. So we are going to say that let the density of that rock be rho, all right, rho, the Greek alphabet rho, and then the mass of that substance m, as shown on your screen, m, as shown on your screen, as well as the volume of the rock being v, the volume being v. Since we have to find the density it means we don't have a value for the density, but we have to convert the mass from the grams to the kilograms. And as I said earlier, we have to divide the mass there by a thousand. Now, the mass of the rock was given as 100 grams. So this means that if we want to convert the mass from grams to kilograms, we have to divide by 1,000. And when you divide 100, by 1,000, as shown on your screen, you will get 0 0.1 kilograms. 0 0.1 kilograms. I hope you are following the discussion. So we move on to that of the volume. We've been given the volume to be 10 meters cube. 10 meters cube. So it means that we can find the density easily using the expression density equals mass over volume or density equals m over v. Now, when doing that, since the mass has been converted as 0.1, it means we have to divide the 0.1 by 10. And that means that the density will be equal to 0.1 divided by 10, and the units, therefore, should be in kilograms per meter cube. Now, in science, when you do any calculation, you have to put the unit there. Otherwise, you will not score anything. So when you finish your calculation, you have to put the unit there to get your points. So here we say that the density will be equal to 0 0.1 kilograms per meter cube. So we can see that the density of that rock spoken about by the question is 0 0.1 kilograms per meter cube. So we are done with an example of a calculation on density. You can look around and also get questions and try and solve them using a simple mathematical expression. All right, so we have seen that some substances are more heavier, like I said, than the others. And you want to find out what actually causes that. So here, you have to find the mass and you divide by the volume. And to help us do this, you will need certain apparatus. And what we use is that um, of the beaker, and then we also use the burette as well as the weighing scale. Now, when we're in JHS, we're told that the beaker helps us to measure the rough volumes um, of liquids. But it's not only used for that. We can also use it for weighing objects. But we use a small beakers. So we also have the burette that helps us discharge specific volumes of liquids. And then we can also use the weighing scale as shown on the screen. So we have a beaker. It looks more or less like our caps at home. And then we have a burette with a pointed end. And we put liquids into burettes using the funnel. And we can also regulate the amount of fluid coming from the burette using the regulator attached. So on the screen, we have a beaker. And then we also have a burette. Now, next to the beaker and the burette, we'll have to do weighing. So we we'll need a weighing scale. Shown on the screen, we have a weighing scale. This is exactly how a weighing scale looks like. In a the laboratory, there are different types of weighing scales, and they are used for different 
things or different measurements. So for this, we are going to use this type of weighing scale, the electronic weighing scale. It's very easy to use the electronic weighing scale. Okay, so now if we have these instruments or apparatus, how do we go by the determination of the density of a substance? Since we have to measure the mass of the object in question, we have to make sure that whatever we are going to use is clean and also dry. So for the procedure, we shall follow very simple steps and we shall start by saying that you weigh a clean dry beaker and you record its mass M1. So it means that you take the beaker, you also get your weighing scale, you set your weighing scale and then you drop the beaker on the weighing scale gently, not in a rush, gently so that you can easily measure the mass. So you wait a while for the, uh, the weighing scale to be stable and you record the mass. So let's assume that the mass we recorded happens to be M1. It is M1. Now when you are done doing the measurement of the, the beaker, we also take um, the liquid in question and then we run off a known volume of the liquid into the beaker. So here we are determining the density of a liquid, the density of a liquid. So you, you take your liquid, you use a burette, and then you run off exact volume of the liquid you want to work with into the beaker. Now when you pour the liquid into the beaker, you close your regulator so that you don't have excess of the volume. Then you do reweighing. So you determine the mass of the empty beaker, then you redetermine the mass of the beaker plus the liquid in question. So you weigh the beaker, and the liquid and record the mass M2. So we have M1, we have M2, and we have V of the liquid. On our screens, per the calculation, we can see that the calculation of the density of the liquid would therefore be done according to the steps we have below. So we determined the mass of the empty beaker and we said it was M1. And we also went on to determine the mass of the empty beaker plus the liquid. So we have the beaker alone. They have the beaker plus the liquid giving us the M2. So we move on to determine the mass of the liquid. And since we have two masses, M1 and M2, M1 is the mass of the empty beaker. If we want to determine the mass of only the liquid, only the liquid, then we have to subtract the mass of the empty beaker from the masses of the empty beaker and the liquid. So if you do that, you will get the expression mass of the liquid should be equal to M2 minus M1. So you have M2 minus M1. We have already determined the volume of the liquid using the burette and we got V. So now we have the parameters we need, the mass of the, the liquid and we also have the mass, uh, the volume of the liquid. And since the mass of the liquid is given as M2 minus M1, if we just divide the mass M2 minus M1 by the volume we measured using the burette, that gives us the density of the liquid. So if you want to determine the density of any liquid around you, all you need are three things. You will need a weighing scale, you also need a beaker, and then you can also run it using a burette. Sometimes you can also use a measuring cylinder, but you will not get a very, very sharp volume as you want with respect to the bread. So we have the density of the liquid given as M2 minus M1. So we have dealt with the liquids. What about solids? Okay, liquids is very easy to measure their volumes using burette as well as measuring cylinder. What about solids? Now most solids we see around us can largely be classified into two. So we can have regular objects, and then we also have irregular objects. Some objects, you can easily determine their volumes or dimensions by measurements. So all you need to do is get the object in question, use a rule or a ruler, and measure the dimension. And that can help you do any calculation you want to do on that object. So we say that regular objects are objects with fixed geometrical shapes. So their dimensions don't change fixed geometrical shape. For example, you can talk about a chalk box, or you can also have um, a cylinder. But I have more examples on your screen, and you see that we have examples in the form of 
books, you can have a pencil, you can also have a block of wood, a block of wood, and then you can also have your favorite basketball or football. These are all examples of regular objects, and the dimensions of a regular object can be measured with the help of a meter rule. So you can determine the dimensions like we did in the earlier lesson where you measure the dimension of um, objects or the length of objects or their sizes using a meter rule and you're able to do other calculations from that. So if you want to measure simple distances, you can use a meter rule and then that will help you do that. Don't forget your veneer calipers as well as your micrometer screw gauge and you can also bring on board your spherometer. We are looking at distance, distance and the shape of the object. Well, so when you have the shape of the object, then you can use appropriate formula. The appropriate formula to determine the volume of the object. You can use any appropriate formula that fits that object to determine its volume. I have on the screen some few regular objects and the formula we can use to determine their volumes. So some regular objects and the formula for finding their volumes. A cuboid, a cuboid, solid regular object with the same dimension, three dimensions. So the volume of a cuboid is given as the, the multiplication of the three dimensions. So if you have A being one side, since all the sides are the same, then you have to multiply A by A by another A. So that gives you A to the power three or A cubed. So we say that where A is a dimension of one side and V, the volume of the cuboid. So we have on our screen a typical diagram of a cuboid, just to refresh our minds on what a cuboid is. So we have a, a solid object and all the sides are the same. Remember when we were at the lower level, we used to draw cuboids using squares and then we draw lines to join the square and we are excited. So this is our cuboid and to find the volume, you only need a dimension of one side and multiply it three times by itself. So we have a cuboid. We can also have a rectangular solid, a rectangular solid. And since rectangular solids do not have their dimensions being the same, it means we have to factor in all the dimensions. And the volume of a rectangular solid is given as the length. So we have the length, then you have the width, then you have the height. So if you have a box, a very long box, then you can have the longer side of the down part being the length, and then the side being the width, and the, the, the part of the box from the bottom to the top will be the height. So per the expression we have here, we have V equals L times V times W times H, where L is the length and W is the width and H is the height. So we have on our screen also a picture of a rectangular prism. Joy learning is getting more exciting. So here we have the rectangular prism and we can have the dimension. So you notice that with the rectangular prism, one side is very, very long and then the other is relatively shorter compared to the, the height, which is quite longer than the rest. So we have a very long, then relatively shorter, then we have a medium somewhere between them. Well, in our day-to-day -day activities, we often come across spheres. So we cannot finish this concept without talking about spheres. Spheres are naturally round, solid figures, very round, solid figures. Like we have in the case of our basketball, those of us who like playing basketball, our footballs. And then if you're a tennis player, whether table or lawn, they are all round. So we are, they, are, they are examples of spheres. And since they are not like the the cuboid as well as the rectangular prism, what you can do is to measure their radius or you can measure their diameter. Then you can also use that to determine their volume. I know when we're doing the concept of volume measurement, you came across this. So I'm throwing a question to you to tell me which equipment you use to determine the radius of a sphere, the radius of a sphere. So here we can say that the volume there will be equal to four over three pi r cubed, four over three pi r cubed, the interesting pi r cubed. So here we can say that where V equals the volume of the sphere. 
So we have V being the volume of the sphere, and then R, the radius of the sphere. So we have R being the radius of the sphere. So on our screen, again, we have a diagram of a sphere, and we have the radius from the center to the surface, R, and we can see that the volume of the sphere will, give, will be given as the 4 over 3 pi r cubed. So we can easily use this expression to calculate the volume of your football, of that golf ball, of that table tennis, all right, ball, and then any other object that is round, we can use a simple volume to determine it. So viewers, take note of this. And when you have the appropriate equipment, you can easily determine the diameter, how fit that gives you the radius, and then you substitute it into this expression. This gives you the volume of the sphere. But we also have cones. Cones. Well, at home, we have objects that look like cones, like the funnel. So they look like the funnel, but they are solid figures, and they have a circular base and one edge slants vertically upwards, more or less like a triangle. So we have like something like a triangle with a circular base. Now for cones, they also have volumes, and their volumes are captured in terms of one-third pi r squared, then times the vertical height. Please remember, times the vertical height. We have the slant height, and we have the vertical height. So the volume of a cone is given as one third pi r squared times the vertical height. And the r is the radius of the base, the radius of the base. So we see that where r is the radius of the base and h, the vertical height of the cone. So on your screens, we have a cone and how to determine the volume of the cone. So if you look at it carefully, it looks like you have a triangle and then you also have at the base all right, a circular um, surface. But you can easily draw a triangle through the cone and work other things. Those of you who are interested in, uh, in mathematics, you can um, move on and then enjoy it. Well, apart from the cones, we also have objects that look more or less like cones, but they have square bases or they have other shapes. Sometimes you can have it rectangular, you can have it square, you can also have it hexagonal, whichever shape you can imagine. And we call them pyramids. Pyramids. I'm sure when you mention pyramid, there's a country that comes in mind. That is Egypt. So we can have pyramids with a rectangular base. So here we are looking at pyramids with a rectangular base. So if you have a pyramid, which also looks like a cone, but with a rectangular base, then we can say that the volume can also be captured as one third times the area of the base times the vertical height. So it's just like the cone, but I notice that in this case, we have to calculate the area of the base, then you can also multiply it by the height. So showing on your screen, um, we have an example of a pyramid with a rectangular base. An example of a pyramid with a rectangular base. So you, we have the width for the rectangular base, and we also have the length for the rectangular um, base pyramid and also the vertical height, the vertical height. Those of you doing mathematics and you love doing mathematics, you know that there are other parts in mass which brings us more illumination into these objects. So we can move on to irregular objects. But before we do the irregular object, it means that to find the density of a regular object, like the examples I cited earlier, all you have to do is get an object, you need a weighing scale, then you weigh the mass of the, you determine the mass of the object by weighing it on a scale. Then you use your meter rule or whichever equipment you want to use to measure the, the dimensions and use a formula to generate the volume. So with regular objects, it's very easy to determine their densities. All you need are their masses as well as the volumes that you have calculated and you divide the mass in kilograms by the volume in meter cube. I hope it is very simple here. So, viewers, we move on to irregular. So we started with liquids. We have worked on solids, which are regular. I want to move on to irregular objects. These objects do not have specific shapes. You cannot easily determine their dimensions and use calculations to determine their volume. But in science, we can do this also. 
All right, in science, we can do this very, very easily. So irregular objects, we say that these are substances we do not have a fixed uh, geometrical shape. So they are very tiny, some of them are very tiny, and they, are, they have angles you cannot easily determine using your mass measuring equipment. So examples of irregular objects as captured on your screen are pieces of broken glass. So you accidentally shattered the glass, it fell down, it broke. You cannot easily determine the dimension, so you can, but you can still determine the density anyway. Okay, so we have pieces of broken glass. You can have a stone as well as some pieces of charcoal. All right, now we'll be looking at how we can determine the densities of these irregular objects. How can we determine the densities of these irregular objects? For example, a piece of stone, a piece of a rock, or a piece of a metal. Just like the previous experiment, we again use equipment, what we call the apparatus, okay? So we'll be using volume measuring equipment, particularly we use a measuring cylinder. And then we can also use a piece of an inelastic thread, a thread of insignificant mass, all right? So it will not contribute much to the density of the object you are determining. Then um, you also have to use a weighing scale. So we are going to use a weighing scale. Now with the apparatus, so we have measuring cylinder, we have a piece of thread, and then we are also using a weighing scale. Shown on your screen are pictures of the things I just mentioned. So we have an inelastic thread on the left-hand side, and on your right-hand side of your screen, you have a measuring cylinder. I know at school you have most of this equipment, and some of you who are blessed, you have some at home. So we have an inelastic thread, and we also have a measuring cylinder. Let us look at the procedure. We've seen the mass measuring equipment already. That is the weighing scale, so I didn't add that picture. Okay, so let's look at the procedure. How do we determine the density of an irregular object? Of an irregular object. Remember, the object cannot, uh, the mass can be determined, but the volume cannot be calculated readily. So we have to find the volume indirectly. We have to find the volume indirectly. So what, this is how we go about it. You weigh the dry solid using the weighing balance. So you have an irregular object, you have a weighing balance, you clean it well, then you drop it on a weighing scale, then you measure. Please, you don't use aggression gently. Scientific equipment are very fragile. So you gently drop it on the weighing scale. Then after determining the mass, you note it down. So you note the mass down. The next thing you can do, you have to do, is to tie the object with a piece of the thread, not the entire thread. You just cut a little, then you tie it so that you can gently lower it into the measuring cylinder containing water. So you tie the thread around a stone, in this case, a regular object, and then you partly fill a measuring cylinder with water and recall the initial level. So here, you have a measuring cylinder. Let's go back. You have a measuring cylinder on your right hand side. You partly or uh, you partly fill it with water, or you can have the, the volume and add that amount of water to it and note the volume V1. Okay, so you, you put water into it and note the volume V1. But make sure the water you put in there will be enough to cover the solid object you have when you immerse it in it. So that is a measuring cylinder. Then after doing that, you tie the object in question and gently lower it down the water in the measuring cylinder. Again, we don't use aggression here because if you just dump it in there, some of the water might splash and your volumes will not be accurate. So please make sure you observe some of these petty precautions. So we gently lower it into this measuring cylinder and the volume of the water in the measuring cylinder will rise again. So this means that we are going to have two volumes, V1 and then V2. And uh, we are going to use these volumes to help us determine the density of this irregular object. And for that matter, an example here we said was the stone. So we have partly filled the measuring cylinder with water, and then we recorded the volume as V1. And then we also drop in gently, like I said, the stone in the measuring cylinder, and the level of the water rises. So we are going to have two volumes, V1 and then V2. In addition to that, our scale also gives us the mass of the irregular 
object. So we have the formula already. We just put it in there and determine the volume of the irregular objects as shown on the screen. So on the screen here, we have a picture of a scale with a stone on it, an irregular object, a stone. And the stone here is weighing 482.63 grams. 482.63 grams. And then when they partly filled the measuring cylinder, it was around 600 centimeters cube. Like I said, most of these equipment are calibrated in centimeters cube. So when you finish, you have to convert it to meter cube and also convert the mass to your grams. So in this regard, when the stone was gently lowered into the water, the volume went up. All right. So from your screen, you notice that we have about 800 centimeters cube. 800 centimeters cube. On most measuring cylinders, the other right centimeters cube, or you can have milliliters, milliliters. So a milliliter is the same as a, a centimeter cube. Okay, so we have the measurement here. Now, you tie the object with a thread and lower it gently into the water until it is completely immersed in the water. And then you record the new level, like I said, V2 of the water after the meshing of the stone. So if you do this, then you come back to your expression that you generated earlier when we we're talking about density. And to, do, to help us do this, let's walk through the calculation in a very simple and gentle way. So we are going to look at um, the mass of the solid being M, and then the initial volume of water being V1, and then the final volume of water after the meshing will be V2. Well, so we know that when you subtract V1 from V2, that gives us the volume of the object, the volume of the irregular object, because the object will displace the exact volume of itself in water. So that will be the volume of the object. And then you can just put it into the expression earlier on the picture, and that gives you the density of the object. Well, let's take a question on, let's take a practical question on this and see how best we can attempt to answer it. So for our example one, we have a piece of metal weighing 100 grams, and when it was put into a measuring cylinder containing 200 centimeters cube of water, the level of the water rose to 250 centimeters cube. So we have 100 grams, then you dropped it into 200 centimeters cube of water, and the volume went up to 250. The question is saying that we should calculate the density of this metal. So again, since you want to make your work clean and simple, we use variables. So we can say that let M equal the uh, mass of the stone and V, the volume of the stone. So the differences in the volume, that is V2 minus V1, will give you the volume of the metal. And then since we know that rho is the same as the density of the stone, and M, the mass of the stone, which read 100 grams, we obviously have to convert the mass from grams to kilograms. And from the screen, you notice I've divided the 100 there by the 1,000. So you can put the units the kilograms. So the mass now becomes 0 0.1 kilogram. Because if you divide 100 by 1,000, you get 0 0.1 kilogram. And the differences in volume, V equals V2 minus V1, will be equal to 250 minus 200. So we have 250 minus 200. That gives us 50 centimeters cube. So we have 50 centimeters cube. Again, we have to convert the 50 centimeters cube to meter cube, and we do that by dividing it by a million, 10 to the power 6. I hope you remember I said it earlier, 10 to the power minus 6. And when you do so, you are going to get 0 0.00005, sorry, 0 0.0005. And that is going to be the volume of the, the metal. So we are now going to divide the mass, which was 0 0.1, by that volume. Okay, so when you divide it as shown on your screen, you are going to get 2,000 kilograms per meter cube. So that means that the density of that object is 2,000 kilograms per meter cube. I hope it was very simple. Okay, so we move on to our example two. We need to solve one or two questions so that we become more stronger in areas like this. So, for example, two, it reads that a piece of rock weighed 45 grams, and when put in a measuring cylinder, the water level rose from 29 
to 39 centimeters cube mark. Find the density in grams per centimeter. So you see, in this question, the density has been quoted in grams per cm. So it means we don't have to convert the gram to kilograms, as well as the volume from centimeter cube to meter cube. So let's look at the presentation. So for the solution, we can see that the initial volume of the water as captured by the question was 29. So we have 29 centimeters cube. And then the final volume of the water, V2, was um, 39. So we have 39 centimeters cube. So we can see that the volume of the stone will be the same as the volume of water displayed. So when you put it in the measuring cylinder with the water, the level of the water went up, and the difference there gives us the volume of that stone. So the difference there will give us V2 minus V1, and that means that the final volume, which was 39, and then less the initial volume, 29, will give us 10. So we have 10 centimeters um, cube. And we are also told that the mass of the rock was uh, 45 grams. So we have 45 grams. From our earlier discussion on density, we said that it is the mass per unit volume of a substance. So all you have to do is you take the mass of the object in question and then you divide it by the volume, which is 10. So we are going to divide the 45. Here, the question demanded that we solve it and keep the unit in grams per cm cube. So we are going to divide the 45 by 10, and that gives us 4.5 grams per centimeter cube. 4.5 grams per centimeter cube. So we can see that the density of the rock is therefore 4.5 grams per centimeter cube. Viewers, uh, remember that if you want to convert gram per cm cube to kilograms, you multiply by 1,000. Multiply by 1,000. So let's look at the third example, and then we move on again. Calculate the mass of air in a room. So you are in a room, you want to know the mass of the air trapped in your room. So we calculate the mass of air in a room of floor dimension. So if you look at your room, where it's more or less like a square or a rectangle, you have a dim the dimensions of the floor as well as the height, okay, as well as the height. So for this table, this will be the dimension of the, the surface of this table. Then the height will be the vertical distance from the floor to the ceiling. So calculate the mass of air in a room of floor dimensions, six meters by 11 meters, and a height of five meters. If the density of the air is 1.26 kilograms, Per meter cube. So here you have been given the dimensions of the floor, and we have also been given the density of air. Okay, we've been given the density of air. So we have to use these two information they have given us to calculate the mass of air trapped in that room. So we know that from the preamble, the density of the air there was given as 1.26 kilograms per meter cube. And we know that if we want to find the volume of a rectangular solid, so you see, we are applying the volume of a rectangular solid, which gives us the length, the width, and the height. So that is the expression you have on your screen. The length, the width, and the height. Where L, W, and H are length, width, and height, respectively. Well, so the volume of the room, which is V, would therefore be the product of the three dimensions. So we have six meters by 11 meters, by five meters, and that gives us what? 330 meter cube. Well, if you can't get this easily, you can use your calculators to verify. So you can get, three, you'll get 330 meters cube. So the mass of air is what we are calculating, not the volume of the room, but we need the volume of the room to get the mass of the air. And from rho equals m over v, we can make m the subject of that simple expression. And that means that the mass there will be equal to the density times the volume. So we have the density times the volume. And when we substitute values into that expression, it gives us 330 meters cubed. That is the volume times the 1.26 kilograms per meter cubed. That is the density. So the product of these values will give us 415.8 kilograms. 415.8 kilograms. So in a room of such a dimension, the mass of air there is equivalent to 415.8 um, kilograms. Remember, a bag of cement is about 50 kilograms. So if you divide it, that gives you how many bags of cement of air you have in there. So we can move on to say that the mass of the air in the room is therefore 450.8 kilograms. 
Now we know how to determine the density as part of measurement. Sometimes it is easier when we compare the density of a substance to the density of another. So we have what we call relative density, where we are comparing the density of one substance to the density of another substance. And we call that one relative density. You are relating, you are comparing. So we say that relative density by definition is actually the density of a substance to the density of an equal volume of water. In science, we compare the density of substances to water. It's very easy to find. So we can easily compare the density of that object to the density of an equal volume of water. Now, relative density is denoted by rho, but we use the subscript on the right-hand side, small r, to represent the relative density. So we see that unlike the density where we use ordinary rho, here we are, we are using rho r. All right, so we have our rho r here. So from the definition I gave, we said that relative density of a substance equals the density of a substance, that substance in question, divided by the density of an equal volume of water. So we want to find the relative density of your phone. It means you must find the density of your phone using the techniques we mentioned earlier. Then you fetch water and, and determine the same volume, all right, of that object in question. So here you can use the, the, the difference by measuring. So you put it in water, find the difference, and you compare the densities. So you are going to divide the density of that substance by the density of an equal volume of water for that very same object. So we can see that density of a substance from what we said earlier is the mass of that substance divided by the volume of the substance. We know that already. So mass of a substance divided by the volume of the substance. So the density of water too should be the mass of the water divided by the volume of the water. Mass of the water divided by the volume of the water. But from the definition, we said earlier that relative density is a density of a substance compared to equal, the density of an equal volume of water. So per definition, the volume of the substance must be equal to the volume of water. The volume of that substance you want to determine, the relative density of that substance you want to determine must have the same volume as the water you are comparing it with. So from your screen, you will notice that we have the expression relative density of that substance will be equal to the mass of the substance divided by the volume because the mass of the substance divided by the volume will be the mass, will be the density of that substance. And then you can also have the mass of the water divided by the volume of water, divided by the volume of water. So since the volumes are the same, the volume of the object and the volume of the water are the same, it means the volumes can cancel. And that means that relative density to can be calculated in terms of the mass of the substance and the mass of an equal volume of water. So you have the mass of a substance and then divided by the mass of an equal volume of water. So if you want to find the, the density of the stylus I have in my hand, you determine the mass of it, then you put it into water. That is, if it will not affect it, then you determine the volume of that object, weigh the mass of that water, and divide the two. So you divide the mass of the substance by the mass of that water that you will obtain. So we can move on to say that the relative density of a substance can therefore be defined as the ratio of the masses of the substance to the mass of the equal volume of water. Just like the expression we arrived at earlier, the mass of the substance divided by the mass of an equal volume of water. So just like we did also for the density where we did a definition and we arrived at an expression and we also determine the unit, let's see if relative density also has a unit. All right, let's see. So we can see that um, in the determination of the unit of the relative density, we will need the masses, just like we got earlier. So we are going to have the density of that substance divided by the density of an equal volume of water, or the mass of that substance and the mass of an equal volume of water. And since relative density is the ratio of densities, remember, density has the unit of kilogram per meter, Cube. And since you are going to divide a, meet, a kilogram per meter cube by a kilogram per meter cube, the units will cancel. If you do the same for the masses too, the units will cancel. Kilogram divided by kilogram. So you have nothing. So we say that relative density does not have a unit. So the relative density, when you calculate relative density, it shouldn't have a unit. 
So let's take one or two examples and then we move on to how we can determine relative densities also practically, how we can do it all right, in the lab or at home. So for our first example, the question reads, a liquid has a relative density of 4.5, 4.2. Calculate the density of the liquid, given that the density of water is 1.0 times 10 to the power 3 kilograms per meter cube. So here we have been given the relative density of a liquid. And we also know the density of water. So what we do with it, we are going to generate our expression, then we put it into the expression and calculate very, very easy and simple. So let's go to the solution. So with the solution, we say that the relative density of the substance should be the density of the liquid because they gave us um, the density of water and they also gave us the relative density of that object. So here we are going to use the expression, the relative density of a substance equals the density of a liquid divided by the density of an equal volume of water. And if you, should, if you do a simple change of subject, then the density of the liquid becomes the relative density times the density of water. So we have relative density times the density of water. And if you put it into the expression, you have um, 4.2 times your 1.0 times 10 to the power 3 kilograms per meter cube. Remember, relative density doesn't have a unit. So the unit of the, the quantity you are calculating there will be the same as the kilograms per meter cube. And that gives us 4,200 kilograms per meter cube. 4,200 kilograms per meter cube. Viewers, I hope you are enjoying the class. These questions are very simple. When you finish, get other textbooks and then read, solve it, and can get back to us. We can also help you. So for our example two, we are going to calculate something about alcohol, ethanol, all right? We have different types of alcohols. This is one of them, it's called ethanol. We have the ones that we use at the barbering shop called isopropanol. These are all forms of alcanols. And remember, that is what we use in making our sanitizers. And remember to sanitize your hand once a while, all right? Within a short time, you should do that. Anytime you touch something, you should sanitize your hand because you are in the season of coronavirus. So for example two, we have ethanol has a relative density of 0.78. If the mass of an equal volume of water is 18 grams, so here they have given us the mass, not the density. So we have the mass of water being 18 grams. You have to calculate the mass of the ethanol, the mass of the ethanol. So just like we did earlier, where we generated the expression for relative density. This time we are not going to use a density expression because we need the mass. They've given us masses, so we don't have to use the density expression. So relative density now becomes mass of ethanol divided by the mass of an equal volume of water. So you have mass of equal volume of water. Okay, so we move on to calculate. So you see, it means that the mass of the ethanol becomes the relative density of the ethanol, all right? The relative density of the ethanol times the mass of water, times the mass of water. So that expression will be using to determine the mass of the ethanol. And if you should substitute the values they gave us in the question into that expression, then you will get 0 0.78, which is the relative density of the ethanol, times the mass of water, which is 18 grams. So we multiply and we get 14.04 grams. So we have 14.04 grams. And therefore, the mass of the ethanol is 14.0 grams. 14 point zero grams. US, we are moving on to the point where we have to now determine the relative density of a given substance. I showed you how to determine the densities of other substances, whether regular or irregular. How do we also determine the relative densities um, of substances? So the relative density of liquids and powdered insoluble substances. Mm -hmm. uh, we are determining the densities of um, relative densities of liquids and powdered insoluble substances uh, are measured using what we call the relative density bottle. The relative density bottle. So on your screen, we have a picture. A picture of the relative density bottle. It's a very beautiful glass, but it also has a cover, what we call the ground cork. So it's also another glass, but it has a small hole inside, all right? I'm talking about the lid. It has a small hole so that when you, when you stopper the bottle, 
any excess liquid can easily flow out of the spout. So here you have a picture of a relative density bottle on your screen. We'll be using it to describe the experiment, so take a very good look at it. The relative density bottle has a ground glass stopper, like I said, and the stopper has a fine hole through it, like I described. Now, this will allow excess liquid to be drained out of the bottle. So if you stopper it, the liquid will have to come out. Now, the bottle has the same volume when used for two liquids. So if you use the density bottle for water and use the same density bottle for aqua, they'll have the same volume. And then you can do your comparison easily. So to determine the relative density of a liquid, we are going to weigh the relative density bottle together with the stopper. So here you take the density bottle with the stopper, the top, you cover it and weigh it, the empty. And then you note the, the mass down, M1. We use the uh, chemical balance, all right, the weighing balance to do the mass, and then you record it as M1. Now, the next thing you do is to fill the bottle with the liquid, stopper it, and wipe the outside. So you take the liquid, then pour it gently into the density bottle, then you stop at the lid with a hole. If the water in it or the liquid in it is too much, the excess will be able to come out of the spout. So it means you have to clean, take your time and clean it very well, make sure it's dry. So you fill the bottle with the liquid, stop at it and wipe the outside of the bottle of any liquid that has spilled um, on the outer wall. So you weigh the bottle filled with the liquid and record the mass M2. So here you have M1 and you have the mass M2. M1 was the empty. M2 is the empty plus the liquid. And then you empty the bottle of the liquid, rinse it well with water. So now you are going to fill it again with water. The first one was a liquid of unknown material, of, no, of unknown density. And then you do same for water. Now when you finish, you are going to have the parameters as listed on your screen. So weigh the bottle, fill the water, and record the mass M3. So the mass of the empty bottle plus that of the water is M3. The mass of the empty bottle plus that of the liquid is M2, and the mass of the empty bottle is M1. Take note of that. So we say that relative density of the liquid is calculated as shown below. It's calculated as shown below. So we have the mass of the empty bottle as M1, the mass of the empty bottle plus the liquid as M2, and then you have the mass of the empty bottle plus water as M3. So if you want to find the mass of the empty, the mass of the liquid, you have to subtract the mass of the empty from that of the liquid and the empty bottle. So here it gives us M2 minus M1, and then you also have the mass of the liquid to be M3 minus M1. So you are just going to divide the masses. So you have mass of the liquid divided by the mass of the water. Then we can say that the relative density of the liquid would therefore be M2 minus M1. So we have M3 also dividing, uh, M3 minus M1 also dividing the expression at the top. Please take a very good look at it so that we can use it to do further calculations. So I'll look at one question, then we can wrap up for the day. Now, there's a question here which says that um, an empty relative density bottle weighs 50 grams, the bottle weighs 90 grams, when filled with rubbing alcohol and 100 grams when filled with water. Find the density of the rubbing alcohol. They've given the density of water. So in, in calculating it per the solution, you have the relative density bottle should be equal to mass of the rubbing alcohol divided by the mass of the equal volume of water. So you are going to do the differences in volumes, all right? The 90 minus, the differences in the masses, sorry, 90 minus 50 and then 100 minus your 50. And if you should put that into the expression, it gives you the relative density as 0 0.8. So now you have the relative density as 0 0.8. Now you come and put it into that same expression. That will help you calculate now the density of the liquid. So we know the density of the liquid, if you do the change of subject, will give you relative density times the density of water. So the density of the rubbing alcohol now becomes 0 0.8. Please take you know, 0.8 times 1,000, and that gives you 800 kilograms per meter cube. So the density of the rubbing alcohol is therefore 800 kilograms per meter cube. Viewers, our time is almost up, but I need to leave you with um, a nice assignment. So take this question down. So for your assignment, 
The first question is that define the following. Define the following. A, density. A, density. Then B, we have relative density. So question two, state two differences between density and relative density. Differences between density and relative density. And for your last question, the relative density of steel is 7.8. So we've been given relative density of steel to be 7.8. Find the mass of a solid steel cube, all right, of side 100 centimeters cube. Remember, it's a cube, so the dimensions must, must still be the same. Well, viewers, our time is almost up. Today, we learned about dimensions, the aspect of densities and relative densities. We said that density is a ratio of the mass per unit volume, or the ratio of the mass per unit volume of a substance. And then we went on to determine the density of regular and irregular objects. We did one or two calculations. We saw that density has a unit of kilogram per meter cube. And then from there, we also went on to talk about um, relative density. So we also went through the same process for density, and we determined that of the relative density. We noticed that the relative density does not have a unit. And if you want to determine relative densities, you use what we call the relative density bottles. Well, to sign off, I am George Loco, your facilitator. Thank you. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV.